Annie Chapman was born Annie Eliza Smith in Knightsbridge, West London, in September 1841. Annie experiences many tragedies, as most families did in these times, when three of her younger siblings sadly died in their infancy at different times. Annie's life took a new turn when she married John Chapman, a coachman, on May 1, 1869, at All Saints Church in the Knightsbridge district of London. She was 28 years old, and their residence at the time was 29 Montpellier Place, Brompton. This was also where her mother continued to reside until her passing in 1893. The newlyweds started their family when they moved to One Brook Mews in Bayswater, located within the city of Westminster and the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea in central London. In 1870, they welcomed their first daughter, Emily Ruth. John worked as a domestic head coachman. Three years later, in 1873, they moved to 17 South Bruton Mews, Berkeley Square, in um, the west end of the city of Westminster, and there their second daughter, Annie Georgina, was born. In 1880, a son, John Alfred, arrived, but he suffered from a disability and was placed in a home or charity school. In 1881, the family relocated to Windsor, where John found employment as a domestic coachman. Tragedy struck the family when Emily Ruth succumbed to meningitis at the age of 12. Following this loss, John took employment under a farm bailiff named Josiah Weeks. In 1884 or 1885, Annie and John made the difficult decision to part ways by mutual consent. The exact reasons for their separation remain uncertain, though a police report suggested it was due to Annie's drunken and immoral ways. She found herself in trouble with the law multiple times in Windsor for her inebriation, and it was believed that her husband was also a heavy drinker. Despite their separation, John Chapman periodically sent his wife 10 shillings per week via a post office order. This arrangement continued until his untimely death on Christmas Day in 1886 at the age of 44. At the time of his passing, he resided on Grove Road, Windsor, and his demise was attributed to cirrhosis of the liver and dropsy. She shared the sad tidings with her friend, Amelia Palmer, and tears flowed as she spoke. Even two years after her husband's death, Annie remained deeply affected. In the latter part of the 19th century, amidst the bustling streets of Spitalfields, Annie found herself entangled in a complex web of relationships and hardships. It was the year 1886 when she crossed paths with John Jack Sive, a sieve maker of uncertain origin. Whether Jack was his given name or a nickname remained a mystery. They cohabited in the common lodging house at 30 Dorset Street, Spitalfields, although their union was never officially sanctioned by marriage. At this point, she adopted the name Annie Sive, occasionally spelled as Sieve or Siffy. Tragically, Jack departed from her life shortly after the passing of her husband, likely motivated by the cessation of financial support. He made his way to Notting Hill, leaving Annie to face an uncertain future. By May or June of 1888, Annie had resettled at Crossingham's lodging house, a refuge for around 300 souls, located at 35 Dorset Street. Timothy Donovan served as the deputy, and for a double bed, Annie paid a modest 8D, equivalent to four pence. Her life found some semblance of stability in this establishment. Sometime later, Annie became entwined with Edward Stanley, a bricklayer's mate affectionately known as the Pensioner. During the time of her tragic murder, Stanley resided at One Osborne Place in Whitechapel. Their weekends were frequently spent together at Crossingham's. Contrary to the popular image of a woman driven to prostitution, Annie did not embrace this path until after her husband's passing. Before that, she relied on the allowances sent by her husband, supplemented by crochet work and selling flowers to make ends meet. In the late summer of 1888, she encountered her brother, Fountain Smith, on Commercial Road. 
Despite facing financial difficulties, Annie remained discreet about her place of residence when speaking with her brother. In a heartwarming gesture, her brother extended his generosity by offering her two shillings. On a fateful Saturday, September 4th, 1888, Edward Stanley returned after an absence dating back to August 6th. Annie's path crossed with Stanley's at the corner of Brushfield Street. It was around this time that Annie engaged in a confrontation with Eliza Cooper, a rival for Stanley's affections. The dispute unfolded within the walls of the Britannia public house, accompanied by the presence of Stanley and Harry the Hawker. Cooper's jealousy erupted into physical violence, resulting in Annie sporting a black eye and a bruised breast. The catalyst for the altercation was Cooper's deception, as she had apparently swapped a florin belonging to Harry, who was inebriated for a mere penny. Cooper and Annie offered different accounts of the events, with Annie disclosing the incident to Harry, and another version suggesting the argument took place in the pub, while the physical altercation occurred later at the lodging house. John Evans, the night watchman at the lodging house, dated the fight to September 6th, further adding to the confusion. Annie's last days began on Monday, September 3rd, when she met with her friend Amelia Palmer in Dorset Street. A noticeable bruise on her right temple piqued Palmer's curiosity. In response to Palmer's inquiry, Annie opened her dress, revealing additional marks on her chest. Annie complained of feeling unwell and contemplated visiting her sister, potentially for the chance to obtain a pair of boots for hop-picking. Around 2.00-3.00 p.m., Timothy Donovan, the deputy of Crossingham's lodging house, allowed Annie to sit in the kitchen. He inquired about her absence throughout the week, to which Annie replied that she had been in the infirmary. Later, at 5 p.m., Amelia Palmer encountered a sober but still unwell Annie in Dorset Street. The day was marked by a sense of destitution and despair as Annie contemplated her uncertain future. At 11.30 p.m., Annie returned to the lodging house, seeking permission to enter the kitchen. It was clear that she was in dire need and her future was hanging by a thread. As the church clock struck midnight on Saturday, September 8th, Annie's life took an ominous turn. She engaged with fellow lodgers, including Frederick Stevens and printer William Stevens. Frederick Stevens recounted sharing a pint of beer with Annie, but she did not leave the lodging house until 1 a.m., possibly heading to the Britannia pub, located on the northeast corner of Dorset Street and Commercial Street. This is the Britannia pub on that same corner long before it was demolished, and this is what it looks like today. Dorset Street has totally gone. At 1.35 a.m., Annie returned to the lodging house where she ate a baked potato. John Evans, the night watchman, was sent to collect her bed money. Annie approached Timothy Donovan, expressing her inability to afford the bed. Donovan chided her for having money for beer, but not for her lodgings. Undeterred, Annie left the office, assuring Donovan that she would return. At 2.30 a.m., Emily Walter witnessed an encounter in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street between Annie and a mysterious man. The man was described as having a foreign accent and a dark beard, dressed in dark clothing with a black scarf and felt hat. Just a few moments after Elizabeth Long's sighting, a young carpenter named Albert Kadosh, residing at 27 Hanbury Street, ventured into his backyard. His purpose was likely to use the outhouse. As he passed the wooden fence separating his yard from number 29, he heard voices in close proximity. An eerie no from a woman pierced the stillness, and he then heard an object fall against the fence. The enigmatic exchange sent a shiver down his spine, Unbeknownst to Albert Kadosk, he was an unseen witness to the events that were about to unfold. A shadow was cast over the peaceful backyard, and the secrets that lay within that space were bound to surface. The down of a gruesome discovery, as the clock continued to tick, the day gradually broke 
the clock on Spitalfields Church chimed the quarter hour at 5.45 a.m., John Davis and his wife began their day. The first order of business was a comforting cup of tea. Ten minutes later, Davis descended the stairs, as he always did. He couldn't help but notice that the passageway door to the street stood wide open, a sight not entirely out of the ordinary in a close-knit community. However, little did he know that this morning was to be unlike any other. Stepping through the threshold into the backyard, Davis was met with a sight that would haunt him for the rest of his days. There, in the dim light of dawn, lay the lifeless body of Annie Chapman. Annie's lifeless form lay on her back, her position parallel to the wooden fence which loomed to her left. Her head rested about two feet from the rear wall and six to nine inches to the left of the bottom step. With his heart pounding and his mind reeling, Davis wasted no time. He left the yard, rushing into the street to find anyone who would bear witness to the gruesome scene he had encountered. James Kent and James Green, who were waiting for their fellow workers outside their workshop at 23A, Hanbury Street, became the first to hear Davis's frantic shouts. Men, come here, here's a sight. A woman must have been murdered. Henry John Holland, a passerby, soon joined the growing crowd. Of those who had gathered, only Holland displayed the courage to enter the yard. The horrific sight he witnessed must have left an indelible mark on his soul. Mrs. Hardiman, who had been awakened by the commotion, sent her son to investigate. Upon his return, he delivered the grim news. Don't upset yourself, mother. It's a woman who has been killed in the yard. Around 6.10 a.m., Mrs. Richardson, likely informed by her grandson, ventured into the passageway, her heart heavy with trepidation. What she encountered was a sight of unimaginable horror, a lifeless Annie Chapman, her life tragically cut short in that somber backyard. Inspector Chandler stood at the corner of Hanbury Street and Commercial Street, just another figure in the labyrinthine streets of London. The early morning was interrupted by a sudden commotion as several men came running from Hanbury Street. The words reached his ears. Another woman has been murdered. Without hesitation, Inspector Chandler sprang into action. In a mere three minutes, he arrived at the scene where a growing crowd had already begun to gather in the passageway. While the yard remained empty, the sense of dread hung heavy in the air. Inspector Chandler wasted no time. He dispatched for the divisional surgeon, Dr. George Baxter Phillips of Tur Spittle Square. The urgency of the situation prompted him to summon an ambulance and reinforcements from the nearby Commercial Street Police Station. Simultaneously, he relayed the grim news to Scotland Yard, initiating a chain of events that would be felt throughout the city. Dr. Phillips, a man of medicine and science, bore witness to a sight that no one should have to endure. At 6.30 a.m., he began his examination of the body of Annie Chapman, sprawled in the backyard of 29 Hanbury Street. His trained eye and experience told him that she had met a brutal end at approximately 4.30 a.m. The investigation was now in full swing and the clock was ticking. The streets of London had become a stage for a gruesome drama. On the morning of Friday, September 14th, 1888, as the city awoke, a hearse provided by Hanbury Street's own undertaker, H. Smith, stood ready for its solemn duty. Annie's remains, carefully placed in a black-draped elm coffin, were gently transferred from the Whitechapel mortuary to the hearse. The responsibility for the arrangements of this somber affair fell to Harry Hawes, a Spitalfields undertaker, who undertook the poignant task of overseeing her funeral. At 9 a.m., the hearse, without accompanying mourning coaches, set out on a journey to City of London Cemetery, also known as Manor Park Cemetery, situated on Seabot Road, Forest Gate, London, E12. Annie's final resting place awaited her in the heart of this serene cemetery. In a poignant gesture, the funeral was shrouded in the deepest secrecy. Only Annie's closest relatives, who bore the responsibility for the funeral's expenses, 
were privy to this intimate farewell. Annie's final resting place was in a public grave, number 78, square 148. Yet over time, even this modest marker of her existence would vanish, as her grave was eventually reused, leaving behind only memories and questions that would echo through the ages. She now has a memorial marker placed near to where she was originally placed in the ground. It is still visited to this day, and people still leave flowers and gifts. God bless you, Annie Chapman. Join our community of history memorial and crime enthusiasts. Subscribe for regular updates on captivating historical stories and intriguing crime mysteries. Don't miss out on the next thrilling episode. Hit that subscribe button now. And please do comment and like this video if you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching.